or in order to get by. Thank you. Uh, there's something right now mm-hmm. called the Medicare experiment, which I've been in, in opposition to and uh, will continue to ensure that that doesn't get implemented. But uh, that's been proposed uh, by the administration, and it is a, a bad deal. I also believe, and this, this applies not just to, to Medicare, uh, but to Social Security or um but basically, uh, you know, a whole host of different uh, different ways that our seniors living on a fixed income rely on this assistance in order to be able to survive. For that senior choosing between putting oil in their tank or, or being able to afford their prescription medication, uh, the, the fact is a dollar does not go as far on Long Island as it does in many other states. That's why people are leaving for North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. So one of the things that uh, I have proposed – uh, is that there is more of a geographical consideration, a cost of living uh, adjustment made. Uh, now, this is quite the uh, the battle and one that, um, you know, that there are plenty of people in many other places would obviously oppose it. Uh, but just the fact is a dollar doesn't go as far on Long Island as it does elsewhere. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I would, uh, why I am supportive of having that cost of living adjustment. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the call uh, tonight, Donna. Um, we have many other callers on, and um, we're going to, just a reminder for those joining late, just two quick things. If you have any questions, dial star three. And the uh, and that's if you have any question to ask, dial star three. And also, I just want to let you know, this is a, a governmental telephone town hall tonight. We can only focus on issues we're unable to get involved in uh, the campaign and politics and the elections. Uh, so just so you know, uh, before anyone asks their question, just please keep it uh, issue-based. And we're go- uh, going to bring on Ev- Evan. Yeah. Hello, Evan. Hi. Hi, Evan. How are you? How are you, Congressman? Good. How are you? Good. Good. I'm going to switch gears a little. I know all the, the national issues, and they're kind of hot topics for everybody. And, you know, we all agree. And I thank you for the great work you've been doing with Common Core and the bridge and and all great stuff. I just want to bring back a little more to a local district issue, which comes into some of the stuff you've been talking about with the federal government. You know, 50 plus years ago, they passed this regulation on this protection of that piping plover bird, which over the past few years has been shutting down Smith Point Beach, as I'm sure you're aware, seven and a half miles of public beach. And we kind of sat down with a bunch of people and discussed it, the county that's doing it, but it's kind of you know, there's a federal regulation that was written so many years ago that nobody ever revisited. And you have county employees who are a little scared of the regulation because they don't understand it sometimes too so well that they take it to such an extreme that, you know, seven and a half miles of beach in your district, which is probably the biggest stretch of ocean beach that has thousands upon thousands of people that would be out there is closed every single summer now. You know, and what, what can we do to try to... You know, the federal government's so big that they pass some of these things, and sometimes they don't realize the local impacts the people on bills that they pass. So I know this predates you by quite a bit, but, you know, how can we somehow, you know, there's got to be a way. I, I believe in protecting the birds and protecting animals, too. But, you know, they documented two nests on seven and a half miles of beach, and the whole beach was closed for the summer. There's got to be a give and take so the people can have recreation and the birds could live. Well, I, I really appreciate your question, Evan, and uh, I, I live not too far from uh, the beach myself. I actually have a lot of great memories growing up, going to the outer beach at Smith Point, uh, which has been closed right towards the end of the reproductive season. There were uh, there were new nests that, that popped up. Right now, you can get uh, up to 100 vehicles uh, up to the first uh, location where you have one piping plover and one colony of turn chicks. Uh, if that one colony of turn chicks and that one piping plover weren't there, you could then fit 450 cars. The beach would be open. Uh, that is a mile and a half of beach that would open up in that case. Um, so I actually have someone from my office going there tomorrow uh, to physically inspect it. But I'll tell you, this is the long term, uh, the long term solution. There is a process where you can, it's called a take, where you can move the colony of turn chicks, you can move the piping plover uh, further east 
there's a, a habitat that, that is made for this wildlife uh, further towards Mauritius Inlet. Uh, in order to, to do that take, to move these birds, there is a process that needs to be initiated by the county immediately. Uh, it takes a while. It's a public comment period. Um, it, this isn't something that happens overnight. Uh, you know, the short term is getting Smith Point Beach, uh, the outer beach, uh, reopened immediately, and that's why we're going to even we're going to make sure that this clover and this colony is even there in the morning. Uh, but on top of that, the long term solution there is a way to ensure that this never happens again. Uh, and what uh, I would encourage you to. Uh, reach out to the county and have them file an application to the federal government, uh, to Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, to start this process where next year, if this happens again, that the piping plover, the turn chicks can be moved to the east uh, where there's a habitat. Um, but I, I appreciate you uh, calling in, Evan, with uh, that very local question, and I'm glad that I was ready to, uh, to answer that one. Uh, now we're gonna, we have, throughout this call, we have different poll questions. And it gives you an opportunity to participate. Let me know what you're thinking, and I'll share the poll results. Uh, the first question is whether or not you feel that the country is heading in the right direction. Do you feel that the country is heading in the right direction? Press 1 for yes. Press 2 for no. And after this call, uh, after this next question, we'll let you all know uh, what the results were. Do you feel like the, co the country is heading in the right direction? Press, press one for yes, press two for no. And uh, we'll bring in our uh, next question is coming from John. Hello? Hello, John? Hi, Congressman. Yeah, hi, how are you? Uh, n number one, I'd like to congratulate you on this type of uh, reaching out to the public. I think that's a great thing, and I thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you for participating. Uh, I do, however, have three questions for you. Number one, I would like to find out your opinion on immigration. Number two, the economy. And, oh, excuse me, and number three, on security of this country. Well, great. Uh, those are three really important questions. So, you know, three of are arguably the, the most important questions. Depends who you talk to. Uh, a lot of people have different priorities, but those are big ones. Um, with regards to immigration, over the course of the last decade, we have had a Republican president and a Democratic president. We've had a Republican Congress, a Democratic Congress, and a mix of Republicans and Democrats sharing control of uh, the chambers of Congress. We've had every combination of everything that I just mentioned, and over the course of the last decade, we have not seen anything substantial, meaningful happen as it relates to immigration. So much of this has been boiled down to sound bites. Uh, it has... You know, unfortunately, the most controversial elements of this debate have held hostage uh, all of the other components of the issue that people agree with. Uh, there are many components of solving challenges related to immigration where I have found the most liberal Democrat and the most conservative Republican are in agreement. Uh, but the problem is, is that there are some really controversial areas of some of the proposals out there. And because of that debate over the most con controversial items that won't pass, uh, nothing is getting done. Uh, and the first step has to be passing legislation dealing with border security and interior enforcement. Uh, when you have a leak in your home, the first thing you do is you turn off the faucet. You don't take out a mop. And if we want to do anything with the, whether it's 11, 12, 20 million people who are here in this country, uh, we, we need to uh, tight, we need to tackle border security and interior enforcement. Now, when you go beyond that, there are other aspects of solving immigration that, again, we have that, that are non-controversial, that people across the ideological illogical spectrum all across our country agree with. And we can't, in one bill, try to go from having 12 million people here legally to zero. Uh, some people might have an idea of how you do that, but it's not passing. So why don't we figure out a way to, have, to pass one bill that goes from 12 million to 11.2. Then you pass something else that goes down to 10.9. Uh, what, what we really need to do to be able to tackle the issue of what to do with the people who are here already, we need to tighten our border and we also need to ensure that the right policies are in place so that if you're catching someone for doing something illegally, whether it's an employer, whether it's uh, someone who's crossing into our country and they shouldn't, 
you have to have not just the laws on the books, but also enforcing it. Every nation's backbone is its rule of law. That's our rule of law needs to be enforced. Um, as far as the, the economy goes, uh, we, we need to do more to grow our middle class. Uh, a lot of people are struggling to make ends meet. Kind of like my, uh, what I just touched on regarding the economy, there is no one bill at any level of government that is going to completely solve uh, all of our challenges related to the high cost of living on Long Island that is going to magically make uh, anyone, everyone who is you know, unemployed, employed, everyone who is underemployed, no longer underemployed. It's about pursuing any type of policy whatsoever that is going to make it easier to, to be able to make ends meet. Uh, so as far as the economy goes, I mean, there has, there's been legislation that's been passed and signed into law. Uh, earlier we were talking about the Trade Promotion Authority, the Trade Trans-Pacific Partnership, negotiating deals that bring back jobs to our country. Uh, it's about passing legislation uh, that boosts Made in America products. This past December, we passed the PATH Act, uh, Protecting Americans from Tax Hike, Tikes Act. That was signed into law, 20 different tax provisions to assist Long Island businesses and families passed uh, policies to reduce health care costs. I'm just giving these as an example, uh, and I could go into a whole lot more detail, but I know we have a lot of other questions. So uh, very quickly, uh, touching on national security, we need to strengthen our relationships with our friends. We need to get smarter about treating our enemies as our enemies. Understanding our enemies do not respect weakness. They only respect strength. Right now, we are being tested by our enemies, and they are watching each other test us. Uh, whether it is Iran, Russia, China, North Korea. North Korea turns uh, a nuclear reactor on, threatens the United States as they do it. Just today, yesterday actually, Iran, after executing uh, the Iranian scientist, they called us their hostile number one enemy, the great Satan. They're all testing us and they're watching each other test us. Now when I say we can't be silent, I'm not saying we can't be silent because I want war. I'm saying we can't be silent because that's how you prevent it. They will continue to test us uh, until we draw red lines that we're willing to enforce. And we also can't draw red lines that we're, that we're gonna cross. If you're gonna do that, then you don't draw the red line at all. Uh, I am, uh, I've been opposed the idea of bringing in Syrian refugees to the United States until, unless they're properly vetted. I believe that the great humanitarian victory that we could deliver for those Syrian refugees is to tackle ISIS, is to eliminate the threats that are forcing them to leave their home country in the first place. Um, when Assad goes, Assad can't be re replaced by another Assad. Iran is financing Hezbollah, which is currently operating in Syria, financing Assad in Syria, Hamas. Uh, so there are a lot of different threats there in Syria um, and the Syrian refugees, the big problem is, is because it's been so destabilized for so long, there really isn't documentation in their country uh, for any of these people coming over there. It, it's impossible to thoroughly vet them enough to know that an individual is not a security risk. And if you allow a hundred people into our country, but only one's going to carry out a terrorist attack, unfortunately, in the best interest of American security, we can't allow a hundred people in. Well, anyway, those are, uh, I tried to get to three really important questions. Um, it's hard to do all three of those justice uh, all in one particular question. Um, but, uh, but that's a little bit of each. Maybe we'll, we'll get back to some of that depending on uh, what our future questions on this call are like. So the first poll question was, do you feel that the country is heading in the right direction? The answer was 24% said yes and 76% said no. Uh, so that's uh, pretty eye-opening. It's you know it's not the first time we've seen statistics like that, um, and it's unfortunate, uh, but it's really an opportunity for us as well because we're going to be electing a new president here uh, in November. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a governmental call. And we're f focused on issues. Can we talk about the elections? But uh, hopefully, 2017 is a year where we're moving in a better direction than we are right now. Um, so, so thank you. That was our first poll question. We'll get to our second poll question uh, after uh, we get to the next caller from Annette. Hello, Annette. 
Yes. Hi. Hi, Congressman. Um, I just wanted to tell you you're doing a fantastic job. Um, and uh, my husband and I met you years and years ago before you even ran for the first time. Um, uh, I think you were setting up your first office, and uh, and you and my husband were in the VFW together. Um, but I wanted to let you know that, you know, we're very proud of you and think you're doing a fantastic job. Um, my question is for the Mantic Shirley area. Um, I wanted to find out what can be done, if anything, to get the funding needed um, to have the uh, railway that runs, you know, over uh, William Floyd Parkway elevated. Um, to help the traffic flow and the backup of traffic that, you know, as you know, extends usually like a mile long south, you know, from uh, the railroad track down William Floyd Parkway. And then again, it goes north over Sunrise Highway heading up towards the LIE. Is there anything that can be done um, to get those the railroad, railroad uh, tracks elevated? Uh, that's an important question. Uh, that's another issue that is all over my radar. Again, I, I live down there as well. Uh, it is a, a hazard in the event of an emergency where you have tens of thousands of people who live on the Mastic Peninsula, uh, and there is just not uh, enough uh, egress in, in that particular uh, situation. So that's something that I'm aware of, especially if the William Floyd uh, for whatever reason that was blocked, then it would become uh, even more of an issue uh, than what it would be, obviously, uh, with people leaving through the William Floyd Parkway entrance and, and, and exit. So for several years, uh, I've been aware of, of this issue. We've had meetings. There's been discussions of a temporary, uh, a temporary barrier, one that's permanently open, an, an idea of elevating... Uh, William Floyd or elevating the the tracks, uh, working with the MTA, the Long Island Railroad. Uh, this is an issue that requires uh, different levels of government to be able to uh, to work together. Uh, this needs to be placed into the MTA capital plan. The Long Island Railroad president uh, would need to request this um, if it is part of that more substantial investment of funding that requires. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you talk about raising the road or raising the tracks, that, that, that costs a lot of money. Uh, there's also the possibility of having some type of a temporary barrier. Uh, the question would be who would be responsible uh, in the event of an emergency for that barrier. You have Mass Lake Fire Department over there. Uh, Brookhaven Town has been a part of this discussion through the years. Uh, I, I fully endorse Anything that I just stated, all of, all of those options, uh, I have fully endorsed. I continue to endorse. I'm supportive of them. Uh, the community is supportive of them. Uh, the request that has, has to get made for the, the, the heavier investment, uh, the request is going to be have, have to be made by the Long Island Railroad and the MTA because uh, they're the ones doing the work. They own the asset. Um, but I fully 1,000% support that effort. And I will say, as far as traffic generally, uh, we've had an issue – with North Fork, there was a proposal to modify the cross Sound ferry to allow heavier trucks, more trucks to be rerouted from I-95 in Connecticut to the North Fork road system. Two mile, two lane, two lane roads all over the North Fork system, not made for longer, heavier trucks. I posed that plan. I got it removed from uh, the DOT's plan from NINTEC, New York Metropolitan Transportation Council. Uh, so that is now dead. Um, and also, uh, we uh, th there you have with uh, the Brookhaven Rail Terminal, you have some traffic that's been coming off of Long Island Expressway with goods being shipped by rail. Uh, there is talk in uh, Western, oh, I'm sorry, in Nassau County, a little bit of Suffolk, about having a third rail uh, that would help, um, as well as the second track, which is currently being built from Ronkonkoma to Farmingdale. So there are all these different uh, assets, um, I'm sorry, uh, investments being made in that, in that rail asset all throughout Long Island, uh, which will also help with alleviating some of the traffic that we see on our uh, east to west 
highways. So I just want to touch on some of the other stuff. Um, but I thank you for the call, Annette. And uh, we're going to ask the next question. Our next poll question is, what do you feel is the most important issue facing our country? What do you feel is the most important issue facing our country? Press one for protecting America's security at home and abroad. Two, help and grow our economy. Three, supporting our veterans and first responders. Four, improving the quality of education. Five, repairing our nation's infrastructure. Six, improving health care in America. Seven, safeguarding our environment. Or eight, other. What do you feel is the most important issue facing our country? Press one, for protecting America's security at home and abroad. Two, help and grow our economy. Three, supporting our veterans and first responders. Press uh, four, for improving the quality of education. Press five, for repairing our nation's infrastructure. Press six, for improving health care in America. Press seven, for safeguarding our environment. Or press eight for other. After we get to the next question, we'll let everyone know what the answer was uh, to that, that poll question. Thank you all for participating. I just want to give you some contact information for anyone who wants to reach out to our, our district office at any time. If you have any issue with a federal agency, with the federal government, you want to weigh in on a particular issue, please reach out to us. Um, our, we have an office in Patchogue, 31 Oak Street, Suite 20. Our phone number there is area code 631-289-1097. Our east end address in Riverhead is 30 West Main Street, Suite 201. The office hours there are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The east end phone number is 631-209-4235. 631-209-4235. Uh, my website is zeldon.house.gov. You can sign up for emails. We do a monthly, uh, every, at the end of every month, we give an update on what we've been working on. If you want to sign up our Facebook, you can visit me at Congressman Lee Zeldin. We're on Twitter at REP Lee Zeldin. And also on my DC address, 1517 Longworth House Office Building, Washington. Our DC phone number is 202 225 3826. So, um, our next uh, question is coming in from Valerie. Hello, Valerie. Oh, hi. Hi. I'm thinking ahead in time. Uh, people seem to be moving to cities, Shanghai, Beijing. This seems to be the trend, right? So, since we're such a close extension of New York City, why aren't we thinking in terms of, you know, having some kind of a cap on population? Um, bringing in infrastructure that really works. And like the woman was saying about the train, um, I'm not sure what that guy was talking about who wanted to open up the beaches. I mean, one of the reasons why we have the clovers on the beach is to also start to stop the erosion and the amount of people just flocking and not picking up their litter, leaving their shit everywhere. I mean, it's unbelievable what's going on. I live in Southampton. I can't believe what has happened over the past five to 10 years out here. There's litter everywhere. People are living in the woods. I mean, we need to think a little bigger. I mean, just patching band-aids here and there, an overall view seems to be the way to go, no? Well, I, I appreciate, I mean, there are a few different points in there. And a lot, uh, of, points. A lot, of, yeah, a lot of points. And, right, I, yeah. and I'm not expecting you to answer them all, but yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, and I'll tell you one thing. I mean, our, the first congressional district is certainly quite diverse. When I'm down in Washington, D.C., people ask me, where's the first congressional district of New York? The easiest way for me to orient uh, people to them is I say, this is a district that has the Hamptons in it. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I've been there or heard of it. And then once. Yeah, but it's more than that. Listen, so, well, no, I, mean, I grew up in Port Jefferson like, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, right. I have a lot right. for the entire island. Suffolk yeah, County. So has been going down the shitter for years, quite frankly. Yeah, so what, once, what, and I, I'm just saying, like, you know, once I will make that opening statement, I'll then explain that I live in a small town 
uh, just west of the Hamptons with a population just under 500,000 people called Brookhaven, and they'll tell people about, uh, people don't believe how much agriculture that we have on the North Fork, um, we have some on the South Fork too, but uh, it's a very diverse district. As far as the outer beach issue in Smith Point, uh, I, I mean, I'm talking about going back to when I was a kid, uh, there is a there's a small stretch uh, that in, in 1,500 cars would be accessing uh, the outer beach every single yeah, year. Yeah, Lee, 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 I know. We, we, well, a lot of us know because a lot of us have it left. What I'm talking about is looking at an overall view. We can't, I mean, just to, we all know what it is. I mean, the problem, we all know what the problems are. What's the answer to preserving Long Island? And since we are so close to New York, we, this is a valuable, valuable place. Yeah, so the, why are we devaluing it with, uh, with allowing such, such uh, it, it, you know, it's not kept up, it's not cared for, there's not an overall plan. I mean, look, yeah. have you been on the Long Island Railroad? Yeah. I mean, you yeah. go on the Long Island Railroad, it's filthy. The sides of the railroad are filthy with garbage. It's unbelievable. I mean, I understand it's difficult to take care of things like that. But looking at a picture of, like, if we have more people out here, which is the inevitable, apparently, <laughs> I mean, we need to really start looking about not what was, but what we can do in the future. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I wanted to, I mean, obviously, the, the litter piece, I mean, it doesn't matter what level of government um, you talk to, uh, or whether it's just a conversation that you're having with family around the table, uh, I've, I, I gotta say, I've never quite met anyone who is pro litter. Um, you know, some people actually contribute to it, though, and they just, uh, they, they, it seems like they don't care. Um, but when you actually talk about it as an issue, it's just, it's unnecessary, and uh, it's just a quality of life issue. It was a big deal in, in New York City in rebuilding that city uh, in the 90s, just the quality of life components of it um, to make the experience of living there or visiting there better. <clears throat> that, was, that was part of it. Uh, from the conservation piece, there were a few points I wanted to, uh, to mention quickly. Um, and by the way, just to, to clarify uh, something, earlier when I was talking about the outer beach at Smith Point, um, the, the long-term solution for next year um, to make sure that what we see this year uh, never happens again is a, an application that is made from, it's a, it's a request for a permit from the county to the feds to allow a taking, um, but I, I, I had a note passed to me that uh, somebody had a follow-up question on that, so I just want to touch on that real quickly. But a few things on conservation. Uh, one is I've gotten two legislative proposals passed in the House to save Plum Island, to ensure that Plum Island is uh, being used for continued research mission, uh, preservation, public access. The current law is to sell Plum Island to the highest bidder, uh, but there are good paying jobs there. I'd like to see good paying jobs continue there by continuing our research mission and preserving the rest of the island. Uh, there is a plan to dump Connecticut dredge waste spoils into the Long Island Sound. Uh, I, uh, as of right now, the EPA is scheduled to let the eastern dump sites expire on December 23rd. Uh, I'm in favor of letting those eastern dump sites expire. As far as the western dump sites, uh, a couple weeks back, there was a uh, announcement by the EPA that they were going to extend the western dump sites for 30 years. Uh, this is Connecticut dredge waste spoils. Uh, I believe that that should be phased out with, uh, in no longer than 10 years. Uh, that's, that's my position on the, uh, the western dump sites. Um, we uh, extended the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, investing National Estuary Program. Part of what we passed last December is a permanent land conservation uh, credit. It's, it was temporary in the past, making it permanent, uh, working with the Peconic Land Trust and others interested in order to uh, preserve some of our eastern Long Island land. Uh, but that certainly touches a few, a few different aspects. I'm, I, I don't want to get into too many details because we have a lot of questions. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. But those are three quick thoughts that come to mind as far as the conservation piece. And uh, I really appreciate the call, Valerie, and um, thank you for participating. So the question that we had just asked was, what do you feel is the most important issue facing our country? 49% said protecting America's security at home and abroad. 14% said helping grow our economy. 
8% repairing our nation's infrastructure, 7% improving health care in America, 6% supporting our veterans and first responders, 6% safeguarding our environment, and then 6% for other, and then 4% for improving the quality of education. So thank you to everyone who participated in that poll. And we'll have another one in a minute. Again, anyone have any questions, dial star three. We have so many uh, questions here. And um, we're going to bring Nick on. Hello, Nick. Hey, Lee. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Very well. First off, let me preface my remarks by saying thank you for your service to our country in the military and for also serving as a representative in our government. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to serve. Um, and it's, it's something I think it's important. The reason I'm calling is I'm a school teacher and my question is two tiered. It has to do with student loans. I teach at a high school. I also teach at Suffolk County Community College as an adjunct. And I've been paying off my student loans now for over 20 years. I've only been employed as a teacher though for 16. And I just don't see any relief in terms of paying off my student loans. My background is I came from a lower middle class um, family and we didn't have enough money to pay for me to go to college. I was the first to go to college in my family. And so I took out loans to go to college and to grad school to get to a master's degree. Now, as a teacher, you know, beside what other people may think, we don't make a ton of money. And part of the reason I have two jobs is to pay off my student loans and also to afford a family of three in Suffolk County. And I'm just reaching out for two different reasons. One is I would like to know if there's any help on the horizon for someone like me who my wife and I did the calculations. I paid off my student loan. If you just look at it without the interest already um, with that. And the other question I have is for my students, both at Suffolk and graduating from high school. Um, it just seems like a, a problem that is looming on the horizon in a, in a manner which I don't think is being addressed um, both nationally and on the state level in the manner in which it should be, because I see it as a, a big economic problem in the future. And I just want to know, help, you know, what do you think and what can be done? Well, first off, thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, first off, with regards to the, the student loan debt, uh, which has become a, just even more and more of, of an issue all across our country, um, I introduced a bill called the Excel Act to try to tackle a few different aspects um, of the student loan debt crisis. One is we need to give college graduates the ability to get their feet under them uh, before they are drowning in these monthly payments that they can barely afford to pay. Um, when you have your first job out of school and you're just entering the workforce, uh, you are not, in theory, uh, going to be making as much money as you will be as you get a few years down the road, a few years later. You keep working hard, you get a promotion, you move to a new job, you're making more money. Uh, so there should be flexibility built into the way that these student loans come due, not only one, when you have to start paying off the debt so you can get your feet under you, but two is having flexibility based off of changing income. When there's a period of low income or, or even un unemployment, the Excel Act uh, would uh, allow for a, a period where you would have little to nothing due on your student loan debt. For some people, it'll take them 20 years to pay off their debt. For someone else, it might take seven. Um, there needs to be an, an, a more flexibility uh, with refinancing these uh, student loans as well. Um, additionally, I, mean, I went through SUNY Albany. Uh, I had an Army ROTC scholarship when I went to law school. Uh, I did what uh, I had to do between going to a state university for undergrad and then um, entering the Army to help pay for law school. That was uh, what the, one of the decisions I made. We have you know people going to Suffolk Community College for two years and transferring to 
uh, Cornell on a, free, on a free ride. I met one student who got such great grades at Suffolk Community College, they're going to have a degree uh, at Cornell, and their experience at Cornell is not going to cost them any money. So there's you know, a lot of people choosing some of these more cost-effective options. Uh, some of these, some of the tuitions are just becoming cost prohibitive. I mean, a, a university that's paying, that's charging seventy thousand dollars a year for tuition, uh, is absurd. For the, you know, there are people who are coming out of these universities with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. I mean, part of that responsibility is, you know, on the institution. Part of it is on. Uh, you know, the, the government choosing whether or not to pass, for example, the Excel Act and, and how these the debts uh, should be structured and come due. Um, but you know, the, the government isn't going to solve the student loan debt crisis uh, um, all by itself. That's that's impossible. It's also about people, you know, when choosing universities, trying to um, you know find the the right way so that the debt that they're left with afterwards is something that they can afford and I would encourage more students to uh, pursue degrees in public universities to keep the other uh, cost down and uh, but yeah those, those are a few different thoughts on the student loan debt crisis and uh, and, and Nick what's the, uh, the, the the second part of the question well I'm just saying for students and then someone like myself um, I went to grad school and I made the choice, unlike some of my colleagues, I went into education, which is, doesn't pay as much as some of my colleagues um, in terms of career choice. And I was stuck, I'm stuck paying the same interest. I, and there was no avenue for me to get a lower interest rate. And as someone for the past, you know, almost over 20 years, I've been paying off my student loan and never missed a payment. And there were some hard times with us. And I'm as a teacher now for 16 years um, with this, and I'm still paying off my student loan. And it's it's ridiculous in the sense that, yeah, I decided to become a teacher. And because of that, I, I took the payment plan where it was the lowest interest only. And I understand that. I was a little naive when I first got into it uh, with that, but... For someone who's in public service, I know there's public service forgiveness plan, but there's all these qualifications now that I'm finding out because I made my payments on time according to the rules, but they said only certain type of payments are eligible. So the act that was passed in 2007, which will make me eligible supposedly in 2017 next year, I just found out I'm ineligible because I didn't do income-based um, payments. I was paying only interest. And so I would have to change my structure. And they told me that what I'm paying right now, I would have to pay my loan for another at least 15 more years. Mm -hmm. I, and I'll be retired by then. Yeah, that that's pretty wild. Um, uh, I, I'm going to call your office about this, just because maybe I'm a one-off and maybe this is such a unique situation. Well, I, I, um, it, actually, you know, to that point, it, it would be helpful if if you were able to reach out to Matt Scott. Um, is Matt in DC or up here now? If you could contact my Patchogue office, uh, ask okay. for Matt. It's area code six three one two eight nine one zero nine seven. Uh, he has been uh, helping me with uh, all of the student loan debt issues, policy research. Um, but yeah, you know, we could share more information with you as far as what we're doing, and maybe you could share more about your situation. And uh, yeah, maybe, maybe this will help to other people about. too who made similar choices. Me going into you know public service um, rather than in the private sector um, with that. So yeah, I'll be glad to do that. And um, thank you. Hopefully, I'll be optimistic, and I wish you good luck, Lee. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for participating tonight. Thanks for the question. It was important. Uh, so the next the next question uh, for everyone to participate in is, do you approve or disapprove of my work as your representative? Press 1 if you approve. Press 2 if you disapprove. And I will tell you whatever those results come back in. I'll tell you what the percentage is after our next question. Do you approve of my work as your representative? Press 1 if you approve and press 2 if you disapprove. All right, so the uh, next question is from Aiken. Hello, Aiken? Um, Mr. Acton? Hello, all right, we tried that one. It didn't work. 
again, any questions, just dial, uh, press star three, we'll be able to bring you on, although we do have many different questions uh, here in the, uh, the queue. And uh, again, yeah, any questions, just dial star three. And uh, we're bringing on Ed. Hello, Ed. Uh, yeah, sir. I, dittles to that last caller was very, uh, it was uh, interesting. I'm a little older. Uh, my question is dealing with the uh, hard drugs, the uh, selling and distribution of drugs, and, and the drugs that are killing our millennials, uh, whether they're poor, uh, middle class, or they're in MBAs, but the drugs are killing us. And I see nothing but charitable work going into paying for these safe houses and hospice and everything else. Why don't we get more money into these people to help our drug situation, which is hurting our country's morality? I'm, I'm really happy you brought this up. I actually just went to a, a wake uh, two days back for a young man, actually just uh, three days back, a young man, 26 years old, um, a son of a, a friend and uh, just it, terribly tragic. I'm, I'm kind of uh, my stomach's turning just as I as I say it. Uh, this is an issue that uh, I would imagine with your the way you asked your question that you're familiar. Obviously, it's not just a Long Island issue. Uh, I see it from colleagues in states all across the country. Uh, although in many cases, Suffolk County, Long Island has been the epicenter uh, of the stats that were that we're receiving in from all across the uh, the state as well as the country. Uh, that heroin and opioid abuse crisis is one that uh, needs to be tackled from several different components, different uh, aspects, different levels of government, local communities. The Congress just passed and the president just signed something called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Uh, I pushed hard for this legislation, $8.3 billion dollar legislation to tackle the heroin and opioid abuse crisis. Uh, this, I did multiple press conferences just trying to build additional support for it, and I was so happy to see that this thing actually got across the finish line and signed um, by the president. Uh, when, when, a tack when tackling this issue from multiple angles, we have the prevention piece, the enforcement piece, the education piece. My daughters uh, turn 10 next uh, month. Uh, this is extra personal for me, as it is, I'm sure, to you for asking the uh, the question. And I would imagine this is personal for every person who's on this call. Um, I have had meetings with uh, everyone from uh, the the FBI, the federal level, to New York State Troopers, to Suffolk County Police Department, Police Commissioner. Um, I've met with schools, first responders. Uh, those in recovery, um, unfortunately, some parents who have lost loved ones, just trying to hear what everyone has to say. Part of the request comes in and it has to do with uh, our borders and the fact that some of these drugs are able to make it into our country in the first place and not having the right uh, tools, right laws to be able to uh, crack down on what uh, our DEA agents um, are seeing and other Department of Justice. It's a piece with Department of Justice, DEA. There's that component of it. There's the most local component of it, access to Narcan. Narcan can reverse the effects of a heroin overdose within minutes. Uh, but we have to make sure that when we have a Narcan save, that we're getting that person the help that they need just so that after you save them, they're not going right back to using because I've heard stories from people who serve in local ambulance companies, fire departments, police, talking about how they have had multiple Narcan saves uh, in a single day. It's about education in our schools. Um, some of our school districts start health classes in the first grade, teaching about this and, and, and providing important lessons to our kids in the first grade, other school districts in the sixth grade. Um, Part of this relies on uh, the school district itself, and part of it are grant programs where local law enforcement and other experts can come in. Uh, so there, there really is a lot that goes into it. Uh, CARA was the number one priority for everyone who's been coming to Washington, D.C., uh, lobbying for legislation to get passed in Congress. And, you know, there's all this talk, you know, if, if you watch the news, 
Um, they rare they, they don't ever tell you about anything good that happens in government. If you watch like the national news, I don't care if you put on you know Fox, CNN, MSNBC. They, you know they'll, they're covering the presidential race. Maybe they'll tell you about you know something that that blew up that day. And if they tell you about anything that is is going on with Congress, they'll usually tell you about something that doesn't get done. Uh, meanwhile, there have been uh, there have been so many different examples. Earlier in this call, I talked about the five-year fully funded highway bill. I mentioned earlier about my Common Core proposal that passed uh, the Safe Bridges Act, which got into the five-year highway bill, CARA, which got passed, permanent reauthorization of the Zadroga Act. Uh, unfortunately, the stuff just doesn't get covered and people get discouraged. Um, but the CARA Act did get passed. And I appreciate your question uh, on that. So thank you, Ed. Right on. Uh, yeah, thank you. And um, so the answer to the uh, last question, do you approve or disapprove of my work as your representative? And thank you to everyone uh, for the great response. Uh, it's This is humbling. 87% um, said you approve. 13% say you disapprove. Uh, so I really do appreciate everyone for providing uh, such uh, very generous support. Uh, and it really is such a huge privilege to serve in Congress, uh, being your representative. So thank you. Uh, that that really is humbling. Uh, and thank you all for participating in this call tonight. Um, and we see a lot of questions. If you have any questions, you could dial uh, star three. And the next caller is Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Can you hear me? Oh, I thought you said Justin. I'm sorry. That's okay. Jessica, what's <laughs> Hi. Um, I guess so this sort of branches off on, on what the gentleman who called before um, talked about. Um, you know, I'm, I was aware of, you know, all the money that was being given to New York State, I guess, Cuomo, whoever, um, uh, allowed, uh, okay, a lot of money to be... Um, used for substance abuse treatment and prevention, like you said. Um, I was just wondering, you know, how, um, you know, moving a little bit past that, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous, um, uh, what can be done um, to sort of take the, because right now it feels like, and, and I have personal experience with this, unfortunately, unfortunately, I guess. But, um, you know, what can be done to sort of take the power away from the insurance companies um, and give it back to the professionals, the healthcare professionals? Because um, right now it's, the insurance companies sort of dictate, you know, the length of a stay, um, you know, inside an, an, an inpatient. Or they dictate um, someone's ability to even go to long-term care. You know, I, I hear a lot of times people are being told, you know, we'll fail outpatient and, you um, you know, we'll pay for you to go somewhere a little bit longer. Um, but a lot of times people people don't live to, to see that, unfortunately. Um, so I didn't know if there's anything that, that you know, a, a politician, a congressman could do um, to sort of give give the power of care back to the people who actually provide care. Um, yeah, it's a, so it's a great question. And I, I served for four years in the state Senate before serving these past 19 months in Congress, and I've gotten a little bit of perspective on this particular question from the state level and a little bit of a perspective on it from the federal level. Uh, what I saw in Albany was a very powerful interest group with the insurance companies, and when there was a good legislative proposal where someone would file a bill to help solve an issue like this, a lot of these great solutions would, wouldn't even make it out of committee uh, because the insurance lobby was so powerful. Um, the issues uh, as it relates to uh, insurance in Washington has been a, a little bit uh, different. Um, you know, we, we have a little bit with re oh, actually a lot of it uh, that I've been dealing with more related to Obamacare, the insurance exchanges, the co-ops that have been created, the markets, the reimbursements, IPAD, there's there's a lot as it relates to healthcare under Obamacare 
uh, with the insurance companies. But uh, more specific with your question, I saw a little bit more of it when I was up in Albany. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I believe that uh, it is critically important to allow people the right time to, to detox, to go through rehab. Um, if you don't give them enough time to get something out of their system, then uh, that is going to be an issue where they're going to go right back to using. If you get it out of their system, but you don't give them the help that they need, they'll go back to using. The best way to reduce the recidivism rate uh, is to ensure that people are getting the help that they need. And insurance companies, uh, unfortunately, are denying people enough time uh, to, to get that particular treatment inpatient. Um, outpatient services, a little bit more flexibility, but uh, still not enough there. Um, but a lot of this uh, I experienced personally during my time as a New York State legislator, and, and that is somewhere where, you know, I think just think the state, where New Yorkers need to do a better job. We all need to do a better job, whether it's elected officials, it's the public, it's the media, all figuring out how to get good proposals through committee, passed by the state legislature, signed by the, uh, the governor uh, to provide that more flexibility that we're looking for. And I've seen some victories along the way. Um, with regards to insurance, specifically autism, while I was in uh, Albany, that I supported bipartisan support. That was the only way we got it done. Uh, but I appreciate the, the question, very important question uh, that needs to be tackled. And uh, the last poll question of the night, if you would like to subscribe for my e-newsletter to stay updated on my work in Congress, please press 1. If you'd like to subscribe for my email newsletter to stay updated on my work in Congress, uh, please press 1. Uh, again, some of my contact information, if you want to call my office, uh, our office in Patchogue is 631-289-1097. In Riverhead, 631-209-4235. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, on my website is zeldin.house.gov. Now, there are literally dozens of questions. Uh, uh, I know that uh, many of you wanted to ask questions, so this is, uh, this is what we're able to do. I love doing these telephone town halls. I thank you all for participating. If you haven't been able to ask your question yet, what you're able to do at the end of this call is leave a message, and then we're able to get back to every single one of you on your call. So I would please ask you at the end of this call right now, please leave a message and we can get back to everyone's question. Uh, but I see we literally have several dozen questions uh, in the queue. But I thank you all so much for participating tonight. Again, it's such a privilege uh, to represent you. And uh, I hope you all have a good night. By the way, uh, a quick shout out uh, for one of our neighbors, Maria Mikta of Farmingville, Satum Grad, uh, who is down in Rio right now. Uh, our only New York One Olympian, as far as I know, and she is competing as a speedwalker, Maria Mikta. So uh, while everyone is out there rooting for the Chinese,